The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Canada has got a drug problem. With deaths and overdoses up sharply, particularly from opioid use, is it time for dramatic action? Tonight we'll debate whether Canada should decriminalize harder drugs for personal use. Then we'll hear why chiefs of police from across the country support such a move and how it might work. Also, we'll tune in to new research about why so-called party drugs might be useful in the treatment of depression. It's Thursday, October 21st, and that's next on The Agenda. Last May, Vancouver asked the federal government to decriminalize possession of illicit drugs for personal use in that city. Toronto is expected to make a similar request. Just a few years ago, such an idea would have seemed impossible. But here we are. Is it a good idea? Let's debate that with, in Fairfax, Virginia, David Murray. He's former chief scientist and associate deputy director in the U.S. federal government's Office of National Drug Control Policy. He's now a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. And in the downtown core of Ontario's capital city, there's Dr. Quam McKenzie, CEO of the Wellesley Institute, professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto, and co-chair of Canada's so-called expert task force on substance use. And gentlemen, it's a pleasure to have both of you back on our program. Back in Quam's case, Mr. Murray, for the first time to you. Let me just do a little fact file here off the top to bring everybody up to speed on what's happened over the last couple of years on this file. In July of 2020, the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police called on federal lawmakers here to decriminalize the possession of small amounts of illegal drugs for personal consumption. In August of the same year, the Public Prosecution Service of Canada issued a directive asking federal lawyers to avoid prosecuting what they called simple drug possession cases unless there are major public safety concerns and to pursue only, quote unquote, the most serious cases. If we go to 2020 again, there was an Ipsos poll saying that nearly half, 47%, of Canadian respondents supported decriminalization. But if we go to a poll this year by Angus Reid, it showed that 59% of respondents nationally favored removing criminal penalties for possessing small amounts of illicit drugs. So a significant uptick there. Let's get into this. Quam McKenzie, is it time to remove criminal penalties for personal possession of small amounts of drugs that are harder than marijuana? Well, thanks very much for uh, inviting me on, uh, Steve. And uh, just to make it clear, I'm here. I'm not here speaking for the expert task force on uh, substance misuse, but I was one of the co-chairs. Uh, but certainly that uh, group found that um, they believe that simple possession uh, causes harms to Canadians and needs to end. And, this, and Canadians themselves, as you've seen from all of those reports, have said, well, they think it's time to end to end uh, criminalization for simple possession. They think that the harms that's done, the stigma that's caused, the disproportionate harms for um, uh, racialized and indigenous populations, uh, the fact that it causes burden in getting uh, proper health care, uh, really, uh, and, and actually the cost to the health care and criminal justice system, really mean that it's time that we need to rethink what we're doing in our drug strategies and criminalization uh, seems to be doing more harm than good. That's that's the general feeling at the moment. Okay, David Murray, your view on this. I'm sorry to think that it's a deep mistake. I would encourage you not to do it. I think uh, the illusion is that what's intended, uh, the theory behind this is to eliminate harms and turn into a public health response rather than a criminal justice response. The reality is you're trading one set of challenges, law enforcement, for a severely increased public health crisis. And we've seen this empirically, and what you're doing is greatly increasing the risk and the disease burden to the general population as drug use becomes more and more normalized, as more and more people increase, the prevalence rates begin to climb steeply, and the overall damage, the burden to society, increases incredibly through people's tolerance to everything from morbidities to overdose deaths. 
And you're also removing one of the most effective tools we have in the public health arena. The presence of the law enables the development of drug courts. Drug courts are places where people get into criminal justice difficulty and the judge and a physician and a drug treatment provider can unite and say, we will expunge your criminal penalty if you successfully enter and complete treatment. When you take away decriminalization or with decriminalization, take away the role of the law enforcement system, you've undermined that very capacity to provide sanctioned, supervised treatment, one of the best routes for recovery. All right, now that we know both of your positions, let's dive a little deeper. Quam, in your view, what impact has the criminalization of drugs had on drug users? Well, I think that um, we need to be very careful who we're and um, think about who we're talking about. So um, probably about 50% of the Canadian population will have used an illegal drug at some time. Uh, if you look, uh, and uh, thousands and tens of thousands of people are using, are using currently. The, the most common usage is episodic usage and actually the a percentage of people who have any harm from their illicit drug uses is um, probably about 10% according to studies. So the vast majority of people who uh, could be uh, criminalized for simple possession uh, uh, are episodic users who uh, do not have problems due to their substance misuse. Can I just so confirm that, here, Quam? You're, you're not talking about marijuana use here. You're talking about harder than marijuana. Well, I'm talking about all drugs. All, all drugs. drugs. Does that include alcohol? Yes. Uh, well, alcohol would, would add another layer as well, right? But yes, I mean, uh, no, I said illicit drugs. Alcohol's not an illicit drug. Gotcha. Right? Okay, illicit, and very good. Cannabis, cannabis is not an illicit drug at the moment. So there are lots of people using drugs, and most of them it's episodic use. And if you, and criminalization, of course, means that a lot of people uh, who are uh, sort of using drugs uh, for what they believe is their benefits, uh, but who have no problems, uh, are going to, uh, are possibly going to be criminalized. This is a problem. Uh, there's actually something called, uh, there's a global. Uh, effort on trying to improve um, uh, drug policies uh, through, uh, and this is uh, the last one of the last things that Kofi Annan did before he died, and uh, they took experts from all across the world. They they uh, looked at this across the world, and it was their position that criminalisation does more harm than good, and that it it doesn't actually. Uh, necessarily uh, help. It makes it uh, is that the war on drugs ends up being the war on people. That was their view. Uh, now, I don't think that these views are need to actually be uh, in opposition, as in it is completely possible to think of ways whereby people can get uh, access to treatment uh, if they want it, because actually treatment works best when it's voluntary. And it's completely possible to try and increase access to treatment. And I think a lot of people would say that that's desirable uh, without people being criminalized. And uh, so I think that uh, it's important not to get stuck in that dichotomy that you uh, either have enforcement uh, of simple possession on if you don't have that, you don't get care. I don't think that's the case. Uh, okay, forgive me, Quam. I'm going to jump in here because uh, time is ticking and I want to make sure I give David Murray a chance to comment on this. Sure. And in doing so, Mr. Murray, um, let me put this quote to you from the Vancouver Police Chief Adam Palmer, who's in favor of decriminalization, who said in July of 2020, if you arrest someone on possession of a drug, that's a very short-term action that doesn't provide any sort of solution. Whereas if we have someone and we can get them into a pathway of treatment, get them proper supports, then you have longer-term benefits. You've heard what Quam has had to say. You've heard what this Vancouver police chief has had to say. How do you respond? Well, honestly, nobody knows the territory you've just sketched out. It's unexplored territory, the idea of methamphetamine, heroin, fentanyl, cocaine being decriminalized, readily available, accessible, and uh, uh, on the streets in a way without intervention is, is unexplored territory, and we're already some degree seeing the ravages of the impact of that on our public health system in the United States, the degree to which we have moved 
with from marijuana's uh, cannabis capacity to be legalized into poly drug traffickers still present. And what we're seeing is a public health cost that's simply extraordinary in the United States. Nearly 100,000 people a year now are dying from overdoses. And the great majority of those are opioid based. The users themselves get tolerance over time and need more and more until finally they degrade their health to such a degree that they either die or the morbidities are so high, the cost to the public health system is extraordinary. And the damage to the individuals and the loss of a generation is something we have to seriously entertain here as the prevalence rate climbs so steeply. Here's another dimension. Most drug users who are in serious drug use patterns intensify over time. And it's over time that we begin to see the ravages showing up. And they use multiple drugs simultaneously. So the same people who are overdosing on prescription drugs have on board at the time of their crisis illicit cocaine, illicit uh, opioids such as fentanyl, illicit benzodiazepine taken, taken inappropriately. They're poly drug users. And the crisis becomes when you decriminalize, you may have an acceptable level of provision of the, the drug through, say, cannabis, through uh, Canada itself, providing some legal access to cannabis. But you also have the black market. It is not driven out. It is still present, and it capitalizes on the increased prevalence and on the increased in intensification of the drug user's needs. So you still got a contaminated, dangerous, violent, coercive black market trafficking operation going on outside. At the same time, you're trying to say to people, possess drugs, use them, and we won't interfere with you. You're, you're igniting a real uh, genuine conflagration. Can, Quam, can I get you to respond to that? Yeah, I think that most people would say that uh, decriminalization goes with uh, increased access to uh, supports, uh, maybe regulation and safer supply of drugs. Uh, so there's a whole number of things you have to put in place. And so uh, the truth is that uh, the way we're going, uh, the criminalization has not worked. Uh, we have seen rising deaths. Uh, we have seen um, sort of use on the increase. And so um, usually when we have a social policy strategy which hasn't worked, the best thing to do is to try and rethink. We're talking about 5,000 deaths just from opioids, 5,000 deaths a year in uh, Canada. And I think most people and most Canadians are now saying we need to rethink and we need to work out whether if we believe that people have an illness, that then making them criminals for their illness is the right way of going. But I guess the question well, that... Can I just uh, interrupt for a moment, please? Excuse yeah. me. I just wanted to respond please. to the professor's commentary here. What, what one sees is you can contain and limit the damage. We still have forest fires. We still have pathologies of society, but we try to limit the extent of them and the total burden of them on society. And you have to have a criminal justice capacity to be able to say trafficking and possession and use have dimensions that are so injurious to the people we're trying to protect and save and to recovery that we have to have some dimension of being able to leverage the circumstance we can't simply give in and yield to what is highly dangerous. And the, the reality is, including in Canada, the, the precincts, the provinces, the cities that have the worst of the overdose crisis and the strongest impact on my marginalized communities, on the indigenous, are places like British Columbia and Vancouver, where the most progressive policies, the most ready access, even the provision of very powerful opiates proposed through vending machines. This is not an access to treatment. This doesn't get people into health and recovery. These are simply rolling over and enabling widespread disaster on the city streets. And they have higher rates anywhere in the Western world in Vancouver of, of overdose deaths and morbidities associated with the availability, access, and normalization of the drug access. And if you do this over a generation, the upcoming generation loses its prevention and deterrence capacity. It normalizes the presence of the drugs and it deeply embeds the illicit nature of this into coercive and corrupt fashion that begins to actually erode the government. It becomes a cancer 
And it seems to me that the most compassionate thing a physician needs to do in the presence of a cancer is to operate and to provide chemotherapy. And the patient has to discover that there can be a great deal of pain associated with that, but it is also the chance to save that life. We can't simply give in. And decriminalization strikes me as trying to make a deal to bargain with a cancer. Okay, Quinn, you've heard the argument. You want to come back on that? Yeah, I think that uh, I can completely understand where um, uh, where you're coming from. I, I mean, obviously, I have a different view. Uh, I do think it's important to re to remember that when people are talking about decriminalization, they're talking about decriminalization of uh, a possession of small amounts uh, for personal use. Uh, and that doesn't mean that people are going to stop look at uh, sort of drug trafficking. That doesn't mean that all of the work that the criminal justice system is trying to do to find um, sort of or to, to work against organized crime. It doesn't mean any of that goes away. This is just saying if you as a person have a, a sort of a, possess a small amount of drugs, you're not going to end up criminalized. Uh, and I do think that it is, it is possible to be thinking about how regulation or even supply of safe amounts of uh, drug uh, can over a period of time decrease the levels of use. And uh, the uh, Global Commission on Drug Policy, uh, the work that I was talking about by Kofi Annand and, co and colleagues, uh, that's what they said. They said you do actually have to try to control supply, regulate supply in order to save people because otherwise you end up with the situation that we have where our, um, uh, our war on drugs has led to uh, more and more uh, sort of toxic, volatile supply that is killing people. And if we want to stop people dying, we have to work on how we can get that done. And Canadians and Canadian policymakers, whether it's the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health, expert task force and many others have come to the conclusion that the evidence-based way forward is to think about decriminalization. Well, let me I put some evidence... This notion let, of a safe me... drug supply is another illusion and a striking illusion. A safe drug supply, after all, you may recall that we had a crisis beginning here with opioids in the United States with OxyContin. Pharmaceutically grade, safe, regulated by prescription from a physician through a licensed pharmacy. And yet it led to thousands of overdoses and the ignition of a crisis that is with us still that also operated in the context of an unrestrained black market okay. still D present. David Murray, let me jump in here. There is no safe methamphetamine over time. It decays and degrades the capacity of the person to maintain their rationality and their health and well-being. I know you there both is no want safe level. And I know you both want to argue empirically provable pack, facts. So let me see if I can get some of those on the record right now and then get you to comment. Because 20 years ago, apparently Portugal became the first com uh, country to decriminalize uh, possession and consumption of all illicit substances. And we fast forward 20 years, apparently HIV infection plummeted from an all-time high in 2000 of 104 a 0.2 new cases per million to 4.2 cases per million in 2015. Does the experience, David, I'll go to you first on this, does the experience right. of Portugal not suggest that decriminalization can work? It maybe it can for Portugal. I think there's a great deal of misunderstanding as to what exactly has transpired in Portugal. They still have very strong laws, mandates, and rules regarding the possession and use of drugs. What they have done is to take the criminal justice system to one side, but they're basically operating with a system that's much more like what I was describing as drug courts. People are remanded if they have more than the drug that they're supposed to have. If they have addictive patterns of behavior, they are, in fact, brought before magistrates and put into a context of considerable social pressure to get treatment and get care of their pattern of drug abuse. What is problematic is that there are 10 million people in Portugal. It's a small, conservative, tight-knit community. And it has families that are intact and well-known community structures. We have 10 million people in Los Angeles County alone. And what we're seeing in San Francisco with degrading homeless people who are suffering greatly and need help and outreach and prevention and protection 
They are unlike what we find in Portugal. Okay, Portugal so let me get to Quam then. uses family to coerce, shape, normalize, and help those who have a serious drug abuse problem. Okay. We do not have that level of civil society. Okay, Quam, maybe the Portuguese example is not helpful to Canada then, after all? Well, actually, um, some people would say that um, Canada is more like Portugal than it is like the USA, right? So uh, I think we'd have to look at that. But there are 30 countries around the world who uh, have gone the path of either never criminalizing or decriminalizing. So there are a number of different case studies to look at. And uh, yes, it does take a whole community approach uh, to uh, move things forward. But I do think it's important to remember we've got here as Canadians, and that's why, uh, because people are completely clear that what we're doing at the moment doesn't work, the criminalization doesn't work, and we have to think in a new way if we're going to save lives. And uh, I completely understand where David's coming, completely from a position of compassion, completely understand uh, his position. But I don't believe that that is uh, what will work in Canada. And I believe that the evidence in Canada is that, yes, we do need to take the hard road of thinking about how we um, decriminalize and how we significantly increase the supports that are available uh, for people who use drugs. Well, let me do a quick follow with you on that, Quam, and that is Vancouver has gone down this road already. Toronto is thinking about it. What have we learned from the Vancouver experience that might be applicable here? Well, Vancouver have applied. They haven't actually got their um, application through, so they haven't actually gone through and uh, started all of this. The police themselves have decided that they are uh, going to change the way they deal with uh, substance misuse because they found that the previous way they were used of doing it was ineffective. Um, I do think whatever we do needs to be properly uh, looked at and evaluated. We have to take, uh, we have to make sure it works, but we have to make sure it works for everybody because uh, we need to listen to uh, Indigenous peoples and uh, look at the models that they think are going to work for Indigenous peoples. And we have to look at uh, racialized populations, in this, especially the black population, and work with communities to look at the models that they think will work for them. Because we're in a crisis now, and we have to think differently in order to um, get better outcomes, because uh, people are dying and uh, families are being moved. David Murray, let me ask you this. You, you've spent basically your whole professional life taking a particular approach to this issue, and you have passionately argued your case on our program here tonight. Do you think that makes it more difficult for you to consider that there may be a new and better approach to this um, and, and that you need to th consider that? What do you think? I consider it all the time. Matter of fact, as part of my intellectual training, my background, and I think it's a calling to think carefully, what have we done, what can we learn, what can we do better? And can we reform many of our drug policy interventions? Absolutely. However, when you see someone about to make a mistake that you can identify with clarity is going to make things potentially worse. And in fact, the evidence seems to show you're taking a bad situation and in fact, in strengthening its power over us. These are not the pathways of wisdom to say people should have access to hard drugs and it should be decriminalized. We basically have substances that are but a tenth to a hundredth of the prevalence that they would be if they were decriminalized. Alcohol is very, very widespread in American life because it's legal basically for anybody who's an adult. The number of users is multiples over the number of users of illicit drugs. Every year that we have seen decriminalization and illegalization of recreational marijuana in the various states, we have seen a 6 to 8% growth per year in prevalence, an intensification of use by youth, and thereby also a spillover into the other drug-using circumstances with meth, cocaine, opioids, and the rest. It preconditions and strengthens the black market's capacity to deliver those substances now. My impression would be, and I think Wisdom suggests to us on the nature of human beings, if they are able to have access as a, at a young age when they're still developing to 
hard drugs and or even high potency marijuana, the psychosis, the schizophrenia, the despair, the loss of life that we are experiencing now can in fact be made worse as a fire can be flamed by, by greater wind and or our incapacity to respond to it in the hopes that it will simply die down. My impression is that's illusory and the evidence we have to date is that we can make a mistake and make it worse. Gentlemen, I want to thank both of you for coming onto our program tonight and having such a passionate yet civilized debate about a subject that I know you both care so much about. Quam McKenzie from the Wellesley Institute, who got the first word. David Murray from the Hudson Institute, who got the last word. Thank Great you, to sir. have both of you on our program tonight. Thank you. Indeed. Thanks very much. Thank you, sir. Police deal with myriad crimes resulting from the drug trade, from trafficking to property crimes to pay for drug use, and responding to overdose and death. And while you might expect that to harden their views and incline them to crack down further, that doesn't seem to be the case. With us for more, in Vancouver, British Columbia, Deputy Chief Fiona Wilson of the Vancouver Police Department, and in Waterloo, Ontario, Chief Brian Larkin, head of the Waterloo Regional Police Services and president of the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police. And we're really grateful to both of you for joining us on TVO tonight. I just want to start by way of background by putting this on the record. In July of 2020, the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police called on federal lawmakers to decriminalize the possession of small amounts of illegal drugs. And here's what they said in the report. It says, we must adopt new and innovative approaches if we are going to disrupt the current trend of drug overdoses impacting communities across Canada. Merely arresting individuals for simple possession of illicit drugs has proven to be ineffective. Research from other countries who have boldly chosen to take a health rather than an enforcement-based approach to problematic drug use have demonstrated positive results. Okay, let's get into this. Uh, Deputy Chief Wilson, was there a particular, in your case, was there a particular experience or a moment in your career that changed your mind about the approach to take on this issue? That's a great question. I would say that probably the most impactful experience I had in relation to coming to a place where uh, the VPD and certainly I support the decriminalization of small amounts of personal possession was my time working in the downtown east side. I did three tours of duty down there and it was really tragic to see the way that we would have uh, non-addicted traffickers coming into the downtown east side and using addicted members of that community to sell drugs to protect themselves from any kind of criminal sanctions. And that's just one small example of many um, that really uh, highlighted the fact for me over many, many years ago that we really needed to do things in a different way. Chief Larkin, how about you? Yeah, definitely over the course of 30 years, you know, naturally uh, through wisdom and through experience, uh, you really look at the lenses from a different perspective. But Steve, you know, when you look at the actual challenges that we're facing, and I think the culture and the evolution of drugs has changed significantly in Canada. Um, what we've been doing traditionally has not worked. And so as a you know, as you as I progress through the the, the levels of policing, uh, and ultimately, you know, get to you know being the CEO or the chief of police, you recognize that our traditional methods, our judicial system, our correctional system, uh, even our own systems are not set up. In fact, they set the individual up, um, and you get to know these individuals. You know, being in Waterloo, uh, you know, a, a mid-sized community, now a large community, you got to know many of the different individuals. And if you apply an empathetic and you understand that everybody has a story to tell, it starts to change your outlook on addiction. Um, but we're trained and we're actually really need to unlearn that, you know, drug use and addiction um, is so stigmatized in Canada. It's so stigmatized in our culture and within our policing profession. And I think, you know, what we're calling on is a changed approach, a modernized approach. Deputy Chief Wilson, maybe I can get you to follow up on that. How would you characterize the impact that criminalization that that approach uh, has had on drug users in your community? Well, Chief Larkin makes a great point. You know, working in the downtown east side, you get to know people and learn about their backgrounds and their stories and what has brought them there. And, um, you know, you can't ignore the fact that 
these, what we have historically been doing hasn't worked. We've seen record number of drug overdoses in, in our province and certainly in Vancouver. And in 2021, we're set to eclipse the high numbers that we experienced last year. We'll have over 500 overdose deaths in the city of Vancouver in 2021 alone and, and over 2,000 in the province. So we really do need to look at a different way of doing business and to try and take a compassionate health approach to assisting people who have addiction needs. Chief Larkin, let me follow up on something you just said a moment ago, because I, I, I suspect you know the chief of police in Kingston, McNeely, who said that cops are basically hardwired to see drug use in a certain way. And his quote is, it's a mind change for the front line and the rest of us as well. How, in your judgment, do police officers make that hard turn? They've been taught that to see things one way, and now maybe they're coming to the realization that things are really another way. A lot of the calls for change around decriminalization uh, are coming from within policing. Uh, yes, at the chiefs of police level, we're looking at it from a different perspective with a different lens. Uh, but I know in the organization I lead, our, our community engagement teams are the ones that are actually challenging to say we need to do business differently. Our, our judicial system, our drug courts are not set up, our mental health courts are not funded appropriately to manage and actually change. And, you know, uh, police officers fundamentally, I believe, want to make change. They want to make difference. They want to solve complex issues. And when you're seeing the same individual in this vicious cycle, uh, and the challenge, you know, Steve, is the social disparity is that once somebody gets into the correctional system, they find themselves in this cycle. And so when they get arrested again for a small amount, they maybe have breached a term. So they automatically end up in a show cause or a bail hearing perspective. And then we set you know, terms of release that really set up the individual for failure. Uh, and so I think you know, internally our members are saying we can do better. Um, and that's what's driving the policy change. Yes, there will be some demographics uh, because of our workforce that you know, this is a polarizing issue in our communities. It's a polarizing issue because we've all been taught, you know, I'm a, I'm a, you know, of the era of say no to drug campaign, uh, you know, I'm dating myself a little bit, but that was the reality. That's what we learned. Um, and it takes this opportunity to unlearn some of those, you know, perceptions, those biases, and quite frankly, the stigmatization of it. I'm going to push back on that a bit because you don't look old enough to remember Nancy Reagan's just say no to drugs. Are you really? I am. I, uh, Steve, thank you for the kind comment. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually, uh, you know, that's the era that I grew up in. And, and quite frankly, to your point, when I came into policing, I very much had that process that, you know, uh, those that used drugs were, you know, criminals. Uh, those that had an addiction issue, it was a choice. Um, why can't they stop? I mean, I had all of those actual beliefs. To, to Deputy Chief Wilson's point, we've not solved it in over 150 years. Hmm. Uh, we've been Taking the same approach where other countries have advanced and modernized. And I think in Canada, if we pause for a moment, in the last five years, 18,000 Canadians have lost their lives due to addiction. 18,000. How is that even acceptable? And I don't want to minimize, uh, you know, uh, other deaths as related, you know, whether it be traffic collisions, homicides. Um, but would we be having the same dialogue or would the calls for action and the calls to change be different? Um, I just, it, it, I cannot accept as a community leader and as a police leader uh, that we continue to see the amount of deaths in our communities across the coast. And this is, you know, addiction doesn't discriminate. This is happening from uh, Vancouver right through to Halifax, right into our northern communities. And I think we can do better as a nation. Uh, and I think our communities deserve better from all of us. Hence why, as a police leader, I'm pushing for change, because I have a voice uh, where I think we can push for change, Steve. Well, you mentioned Vancouver, so let's go back out there and see how things are, are happening on the ground there. Deputy Chief Wilson, if illicit drugs or more illicit drugs were decriminalized in Canada, do you think, going forward, the police would simply leave those folks alone? So the reality is in Vancouver, we've actually found ourselves in a place where we have de facto decriminalization of small amounts of simple possession. We actually, in 2020, only charged five individuals in relation to simple possession of illicit drugs. So, you know, for, for many, many years, um, we've been in a position where we, we really haven't been charging people on a large scale uh, for, for simple possession. And um, so I think for us here on the West Coast, it's quite 
easy for us to imagine legislation that would support essentially what we're already doing. Um, there is some debate about whether or not, um, you know, if decriminalization of simple possession was was uh, legislated, whether or not police would continue to seize drugs when they come across someone who has uh, small amounts. In Vancouver, I can say we don't do that. We don't want to drive people back to committing crime or worse, women engaging in sex work to support their addiction. We want to direct them to pathways of health. And that's a really, really important piece of this is that, you know, we would like to see police moving out of this space and health stepping up with more resources to support people in need. And just out of curiosity, you've clearly made the decision that you're not going to be harassing people who have small amounts of illicit drugs on them. But you did say you laid five charges. Just out of curiosity, what, what would those five have had to do differently from everybody else to warrant being charged? So great question. In those circumstances, there would have been extenuating circumstances that led to those arrests. For example, um, if our drug unit was trying to build their grounds to uh, apply for judicial authorization to enter a home that they believed was trafficking large amounts of drugs, in order to build those grounds, they may um, take somebody from the home who, who is in a small possession of drugs from that home and charge them for the purposes of building their grounds to um, support that application. Another uh, example may be extreme circumstances where we come across an individual who's clearly being exploited um, and really does need to get into um, some resources and need some help, um, like, for example, through the drug treatment court. Um, but when you consider we go to almost 700 calls a day in the city of Vancouver, and in 2020, we only charged five individuals, you can imagine how rare that circumstance actually is. Right. Uh, Chief Larkin, let me ask you this. The Association of Chiefs of Police have put out their statement saying they want to take a more health-oriented as opposed to a criminalization approach to this issue. I wonder then whether the police, and I don't know, I'm asking you, whether the police even ought to have a role in this anymore at all. Should we be sending addiction counselors? Should we be sending social workers instead of police to deal with these issues going forward? Well, I think that's a, an excellent piece. I mean, how do we actually, when you look at the challenges that policing are facing, you look at the call demand, the complexity of, uh, of crime, uh, you look at the crime severity index, uh, you know, slowly increasing across the nation, you know, see, clearly we need to do business differently. And in, in fact, I think all police leaders support transformation and reformation and change. Um, and, and, you know, in many communities, outreach workers are embedded and actually working very closely with the police. The city of Edmonton has outreach workers. Uh, you know, within Waterloo Region, we have outreach workers who are often the first actual response. Uh, you know, in the city of Vancouver, they don't necessarily respond to overdoses, where in Ontario, uh, police services are still responding to overdoses. And I think that that's a conversation we want to have. Uh, the Canadian Chiefs are calling upon Public Safety Canada, the Ministry of Health and the Attorney General to continue the work of the task force to actually engage in dialogue. So what does it look like? How do we actually create it? Because one of the challenges, Steve, I think that this isn't the magic wand to solving addiction. It's not the magic wand that's going to get us out of some of the challenges we're facing as a nation. But the reality is, is that we're a vast country. And so what may work in a large urban centre, what may work in Vancouver, Toronto or Waterloo, will not work in Iqaluit will not necessarily work perhaps in John Newfoundland or in other parts of our country. And so we need to take a very balanced regional approach to implementation of decriminalization, which may include investment in outreach and in, uh, investment in addiction workers. We still believe though in, in reality is that police services should be off ramping this work and getting the citizen the help they require. This is addiction is a health issue. It's not a criminal issue. Um, and even if you look at some of the lower threshold crimes, Steve, uh, shoplifting, theft from vehicles, break and enters, even robberies. These are individuals, you know, who necessarily it's a it's poor judgment, a bad judgment. It doesn't mean they're a bad person. They actually may be actually committing that crime to sustain a drug habit, to sustain an addiction issue, or to feed their family. You know, the Canadian Chiefs, we estimate that it takes $120 a day, $120 a day for that individual that relies and has an addiction challenge to make it through their day. That's how they thrive. And so if we can go to a safe supply model, if we can go to a medical model, if we can go to an actual health model, think of the larger impact on community safety, on crime severity, on the, on the nuisance crimes, the, the, 
the neighborhoods that get disrupted. Um, I think that we need a larger dialogue and discussion. And that's where, you know, uh, we're challenging. The Canadian chiefs are challenging all levels of government because it's going to take the municipal, it's going to take provincial, and it's going to take federal governments to work in unison. It's going to take public health and social services and police services to all work in unison. Now is not the time for division. Now is not the time for arguing who leads and who leads when. It's actually about thinking about the 18,000 citizens. They have their family members, their loved ones, who are no longer with us. And it doesn't discriminate, Steve. And I think we need a, a quicker call to action. Uh, you know, we've seen this. This really started, you know, five or six years ago. I think what's changed the dialogue on addiction was the impact of fentanyl and opiate use. And we saw a transition from Western Canada right across our country towards, you know, it obviously started in British Columbia, uh, where they were dealing with it for probably a year before it really morphed into Western Canada, into Central Canada, Ontario, Quebec, and now into Eastern Canada. This is a nationwide issue that is not discriminating against any community. Well, that leads nicely to my final question for Deputy Chief Wilson, which is, do you think that we need in this country a legally regulated safe supply in Canada for drug users? Absolutely. There's no question that a uh, safe supply would alleviate uh, many of the concerns around the, the, um, the overdose deaths that are happening. Um, and I, I, I truly believe that safe supply is a very large part of the answer. It is not the only answer to this crisis. Um, you know, we really do need to invest in resources in our communities for people to get help. Uh, when they need it and when they want it. One of the things I learned um, interacting with people who had extreme addiction issues is that when they're ready to get clean, that window is often only open for a very short period of time. And we really do need treatment on demand in those circumstances so that when people are ready, there's a place for them to go that is safe and um, medically based. But certainly safe supply is a piece of the puzzle, I believe, that will help us to reduce the number of deaths that we're seeing these days. Well, this has been a fascinating well, conversation because I suspect if we'd had it 10 or 20 years ago, uh, whoever had your jobs would be giving very different answers. But it's an indication of how much the ground has changed uh, under our feet on this issue. So our thanks to Deputy Chief Fiona Wilson from Vancouver and Chief Brian Larkin from Waterloo for appearing on the agenda tonight and sharing your views. Many thanks. Thanks Thank so much, you. Steve. Don't do drugs. We've been told that for a long time. But new research into so-called party drugs suggests that public messaging might need some revision. With us for more from his office at Toronto Western Hospital, Dr. Roger McIntyre, professor of psychiatry and pharmacology at the University of Toronto and head of the Mood Disorders Psychopharmacology Unit at the University Health Network. Hello, doctor. How are you? I'm well. Great to be with you. Thanks for covering this uh, very important topic. Well, one of the party drugs um, that I just mentioned that, you know, we grew up being told not to do party drugs. And one of those party drugs is something called uh, Special K, also known as ketamine. What is ketamine? Well, it's a good question. And you're right. It has quite a history. It was, in fact, and still remains in some parts of the world, including ours, a drug of misuse and, frankly, abuse, ketamine. Ketamine's a drug that was first uh, synthesized in 1962. Back in 1970, the United States Food and Drug Administration approved ketamine as an anesthetic. So the short answer is it began as an anesthetic. But in the last 50 years, we've learned, in addition to being an anesthetic, it's also an analgesic. It helps pain. It's an anti-inflammatory, helps conditions of inflammation. And more recently, we've learned it's an antidepressant. But what's so unique about ketamine, only discovered in the last decade, is that in contradistinction to the antidepressants we've had for seven decades, it works in about one to two days. So it's called a rapid-acting antidepressant. And I'm assuming that would be very important for someone who might be suicidal. But how did the idea emerge to use ketamine to treat depression? It's a fantastic question. It's a really interesting, longer discussion. But really, the short discussion is that We've learned through our research in molecular contributions to depression and trauma and stress, as well as some of our ability to look at animal models of stress, we've learned that in the brain, there's something wrong with what we call plasticity. In other words, the, abilities, uh, uh, the ability of the brain to adapt 
and to form new brain connections, new brain cell connections. The observation was made that in depression and related conditions, there's something wrong with this fundamental process. At the same time, what we've learned is that ketamine is able to remedy this process. It's able to target key molecules, key neurochemistries that initiate a cascade of events that correct this problem, not in two weeks, not in six weeks, but within hours. And this provided the impetus for the U.S. government who actually developed ketamine for depression to begin studies and demonstrate that it works. And the FDA in the United States declared ketamine and depression a breakthrough for people who have depression. Can anyone qualify for treatment with ketamine? Not at all. Ketamine is a drug that should only be given under supervision of healthcare professionals who have the expertise, not only in mental health broadly, but mood disorders more narrowly, and also individuals who have expertise in the implementation of ketamine. What we need to really emphasize as well is that ketamine comes in different formulations. It comes in different delivery methods. Now, what we do at why our is that important to do, Why is that important to mention? Well because, well, because we know that ketamine has been shown to be safe and effective in only a couple of formulations and routes. Not all formulations and routes have been shown to be safe and or effective. For example, intravenous ketamine has been shown to be effective in people with treatment-resistant depression. Secondly, what's called uh, the S-ketamine, which is an enantiomer, a part of ketamine, has also been shown to be effective as an intranasal delivery. There's emerging evidence that oral ketamine might be helpful, although the evidence is still a work in progress, but other routes of delivery, like topical or injection, those are still not recommended. But the key point here is, it should only be given by people with expertise in delivering the treatment. Final point around that is not, over, not everyone's eligible. Mm -hmm. For now, the pe persons who are eligible are people who just haven't had a good outcome with conventional treatments. We usually uh, delimit that to two prior treatments. And more recently in the United States, the U.S. FDA has up updated the monograph for one of the formulations of ketamine to include reducing suicidality. So there are very specific criteria, specific uh, bona fides and skill sets people should have, and very specific premises that this should be implemented. So once it's determined that someone qualifies for this treatment, can you walk us through what that looks like? The person has to be assessed by a mental health care provider with expertise in the area. And once they are deemed eligible and they understand the risks and benefits, typically what we do at our centers, the Canadian Rapid Treatment Centers, what we do is we give them between four to six infusions over a period of two to three weeks, typically. And what they do, they come to the treatment center, they receive an infusion uh, just shy of an hour, 45 minutes or so, and then they head home with a loved one or a family member. So it's a bit like going for a, a medical procedure, so to speak. After four to six treatments, we then sit down and take, I guess you could say a tally, where are we? Have we had some benefit? If the benefit is there, what are the next steps? Not everyone benefits, mm -hmm. not everyone benefits, but many people do, and much more than have, has been responding to our drugs that we've had. On a separate note, but related, psychiatry has had the same type of medications to treat depression for seven decades. In fact, it was the mid-1950s when we had the first of the so-called uh, Prozac-type drugs for depression. And we've really been in a bit of a cul-de-sac, quite frankly, some people do very well with these medicines, but most people don't do well enough. So we felt the clarion call was now. We need to do things differently. People with mental illness deserve to have their health back now. And so we said, this is a new direction we're going to take. It doesn't help everyone, but it certainly helps many people. Now, for most people we see, what we also encourage them is to consider psychotherapy or counseling. Mm -hmm. The best practices in depression is not just about giving a medicine, it's often the case that we can identify skills, identify tactics and strategies to improve our quality of life and function by integrating talk therapy with ketamine. That's done after the treatment, not during. You can't really meaningfully engage psychotherapy in the moment mm -hmm. while you're getting ketamine, but it's after the treatment once your depression has been significantly improved. 
And if we're wondering what it feels like, one patient to describe their experience after a series of ketamine sessions as not a temporary change, but a shift in who I am, how I approach the world, and my feelings towards my own emotions. Um, do we understand what is happening in a patient's brain or body that is creating this change? It's a really exciting new development in psychiatry. What we've now learned is in the brain of people who are experiencing depression, there's something that's not quite right with what we call the functional connectivity. As a metaphor, think about the motherboard on your personal computer, your PC. It's a group of networks and circuits. Your brain is no different. The brain is wired, connected through circuits and networks. And in the brain of people with depression, there's something wrong with the microanatomy as well as the functional interaction of these circuits. And what's so interesting is, is that some of these circuits are responsible for our ability to think clearly, our ability to look forward to the future, our ability just to think positively and to engage our lives. And some of these circuits, which is so interesting, have been the key targets of ketamine and related products. And what's so interesting is it's now been shown that when you benefit from a treatment like ket ketamine, in the very near term, that is within a couple of treatments, that abnormal brain circuit connectivity resets, a bit like resetting your PC, your computer. And then the person who's experiencing depression at the same time says, you know, I feel less depressed, I feel less negative, I don't ruminate as much, my mind's much more clear. So it really is about resetting the circuitry and the networks that subserve the symptoms of depression. We didn't have this technology 20, 30 years ago, the MRI, the type of imaging capability we have to suss all this out. It's not only informed the academic understanding, but it's informing new treatments. So we're looking at other new treatments that also can reset these circuits in a rapid way. Um, for people who are living with depression and anxiety, day-to-day -day events are very challenging. And uh, here's a metaphor from neuroscientist Mandel Kalin explaining how psychedelics can help people with depression and mental suffering. He describes, um, think of the brain as a hill covered in snow and thoughts as sleds gliding down that hill. As one sled after another goes down the hill, a small number of main trails will appear in the snow. And every time a new sled goes down, it'll be drawn into pre-existing trails almost like a magnet. In time, it becomes more and more difficult to glide down the hill or any other path or in a different direction. Think of psychedelics as temporarily flattening the snow. The deeply worn trails disappear and suddenly the sled can go in other directions, exploring new landscapes and literally creating new pathways. Is the feeling that ketamine can also help with those suffering from depression uh, get out of those well-worn trails? You know, that was so beautifully written by the author and really resonates because what I have heard for over 20 years from people who suffer from depression, thousands and thousands of people that I've met, is exactly what that author was getting at. People are stuck in this reel, this rumination, this negativistic reel, this vicious cycle that they just can't seem to break. And they feel very helpless. They feel very hopeless about that. And what we've now learned is, is that that's not just some metapsychological phenomenon. That is a result of the abnormality, something's wrong in that brain circuit that you and I depend on to control our thoughts, to have executive control over our thoughts, what we call in the business cognitive flexibility. And what happens when you take ketamine in the near term, you get a correction of the circuit and the person feels a greater sense of agency, a greater sense of control over that cognitive flexibility. So we always have, as you know, everyone has negative thoughts, but we have the ability to turn it off. We have the ability to engage other ways of thinking and relating, and that very human function is impaired in depression. And what happens when we give people ketamine, they gain that control, a, a sense of autonomy over their thinking, and we hear this repeatedly from people. So I think that is the case. Moreover, that's not just helping people in the near term getting depression lifted, but it also then helps them engage in psychotherapy, engage in their lives. It's obviously very difficult to engage in your life if you're held ransom to this very negativistic process. So medications for depression are not happy pills. What they do is they reset the circuits and the networks which then allows the individual to then engage other parts of the brain that they would need to engage to have a more positive and more 
virtuous cycle going forward. Um, in our final minute here, you know, I still remember watching a video in high school. Uh, this is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. Um, and we were told drugs like ketamine or MDMA or psychedelics could ruin your life. Um, now they're being used in clinical settings to potentially save lives. How should we understand the shift towards using things like MDMA and psychedelics to help us to be well? I think that the message is, is that every drug is potentially harmful. In fact, placebo is potentially harmful. I cringe when I hear people say to me, oh, there's this new medication for such and such. It has no side effects. I say, that's interesting because placebo has a rate of side effects approaching 50 to 75 percent. So how is this so magical? Everything has side effects. Everything has safety concerns. And the first job of medicine is don't hurt anybody. Our job in clinical medicine and clinical research is to find out whether there's a benefit that can overshadow the risk when implemented under appropriate circumstances. So I strongly recommend people don't use ketamine for depression unless they're taking it at a center that's specialized in doing this. That being said, we know that the, many drugs have hazards and a drug like ketamine does have hazards if it's not used accordingly. So if you receive sage advice at your school, obviously went to a good school, uh, and your, your school gave you great advice, and that advice still sticks. But the takeaway is, is there a benefit that can overshadow the risk? And for each individual patient, that's a different calculation. Dr. McIntyre, thank you so much for spending time with us. We really do appreciate your insights on this topic. Thank you. Great to be with you. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Thursday, October 21st, 2021. Incidentally, the 50th anniversary of Bill Davis's first of four election wins as Premier of Ontario. And I've got a piece up on our website at tvo.org all about that. Tomorrow marks one year until Municipal Election Day in Ontario, and Nan Kiwanuka finds out how well that tier of government reflects the diversity of Ontario. Hope you'll join us for that. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org. And Nan, we'll see you here tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.